a really great event so far, and I'm, I'm excited to be participating in it. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Philip Ogren, and I'm going to be talking about, oh goodness, sorry, the, the title's missing somehow. Technical difficulties, excuse me. Anyways, I will be talking about leveraging UEMA in Spark today. Uh, this is not a talk uh, about Oracle strategy. I work for Oracle as a software developer. This is not a talk about Oracle's use of Spark. Uh, if you are interested in that, I encourage you to come back in September to Oracle Open World, where uh, my management team will be uh, presenting on a data enrichment cloud service there. Uh, this is really just kind of a narrow technical talk uh, of stuff that I'm working on. So UEMA is a Apache project that's been around for a long time. It's very mature. It's been in, uh, as an Apache project for, for eight years or so and, and, and was in development for about five years before that. It's very, um, um, it's pretty well established. Uh, one of its claims to fame was being the backbone, the, the, the framework that was used for all the pre-processing analysis that populated the knowledge base for um, IBM Watson, which, which was famous for winning Jeopardy a few years ago on TV. Um, unstructured information implies uh, lots of possible different input types, uh, audio, video, uh, image data. Uh, but for the purposes of, of what I use it for, I think of it as a text processing platform. Spark, which we all know and love, uh, is a big data platform, uh, but it's not really a text processing platform per se. And this is important to note because uh, lots of our big data applications deal with uh, various kinds of human language text, um, from customer reviews to uh, twi uh, Twitter feeds and uh, blog posts. Uh, so, the goal of this talk is to demonstrate a way to uh, take a UEMA analysis pipeline and call it simply from uh, an RDD full of strings. Uh, in this case, an analyze text function uh, could be something like named entity recognition or uh, syntactic analysis. Classified text could be a function that would do perhaps sentiment analysis or, or, or uh, sort of basic document classification. So UEMA has been used for all kinds of natural language processing tasks. Um, I list a few of them here just to give you a sense of the kinds of things people do in this community, in the text analysis community. Uh, it's been used on all, a variety of uh, domains and genres. Uh, and, uh, but, but UEMA is not really a toolkit of, of uh, a library of these, of these activities. It's really a framework that provides APIs and abstraction layers for um, really orchestrating different kinds of, text, excuse me, different kinds of text analysis. Um, uh, but but it, there has been a, a, an ecosystem of toolkits built up around UEMA, and I, I list a few of those here. I'll call out uh, the first two are, are uh, Apache projects. OpenNLP has been around for a long time. It's really uh, well suited for a variety of languages on, on newswire text and, and uh, kind of general domains. CTEX is another Apache project that uh, provides a, a number of analysis components suitable for uh, clinical data that you might find in medical records. Um, and and there's a, there's a, there's a, this is an incomplete list, of course. UEMA has a lot of features that uh, I'm not going to, to introduce you to. Uh, for someone like me who builds analysis engines, this is what UEMA looks like. Um, uh, on the left, you have a collection reader which serves up documents to a pipeline of analysis engines which, which work in turn on a document. And at the end, you spit out some results to a database or a, a file system. And uh, I'll, I'll call out two features of UEMA that really help the orchestration of, of, of the analysis. Uh, one is the flow controller. This diagram shows what the default flow controller looks like. Run this analysis engine, run this analysis engine, run this one in sequence. Um, where a typical analysis engine would be something like a tokenizer and a sen sentence detector on the front end, um, followed by increasingly more complex analysis engines. Uh, but flow controllers provide for uh, conditional and uh, iterative type um, 
uh, flows so that you can have very sophisticated uh, pathways through, through an analysis. Um, the CAS is uh, the only other acronym I'll use today, uh, and it, but it's kind of central to uh, the, the power and beauty of UEMA. Uh, it, it stands for the Common Analysis Structure, and I'm going to de uh, describe that in detail. So uh, the common analysis structure, the CAS, is uh, this data structure that uh, you, get, you get one per document or uh, per unit of work, whatever, whatever your unit of work is, and it holds the content and the analysis of the document. The content of the document is seen in, in uh, something called a view. Uh, a view uh, is, is a really nice abstraction uh, that um, you, 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 in many cases, you want multiple views because, um, uh, well, uh, often your data is in a format, in a specific uh, file format, such as XML or JSON or some um, kind of arbitrary file format that you're stuck with. And perhaps one of your first analysis engines will be to provide a plain text rendering of that document, and you would put that in another view and, and have analysis associated with that. Uh, in experimental research, it's really nice to have multiple views. Uh, if you have a gold standard uh, co labeled corpus that you're training on, put all your gold standard labeled data into, into a gold view, put all your system results in another view so that you can uh, compare, uh, compare the results uh, to, give, uh, you know, to, to produce evaluation metrics. The analysis of a document is uh, represented as typically like annotations. So the kinds of annotations that you'll see are structural things like tokens and sentences and paragraphs uh, and up to more, much more complicated structures like uh, sy syntax and uh, named entities or, or various semantic uh, uh, entities that you would see in a document. So the way the, uh, the CAS works is um, I'm kind of I'm kind of beating on the on the cast because it's an it's an important abstraction for, um, uh, you know, sort of cleanly expressing complex analyses on a, on a document. Um, I'll, I'll just I'll just diverge for a moment. The the NLP community has a has a long and rich history of of skunk work pipeline projects where uh, you know Perl a Perl module feeds into a C module all via different file formats and. Uh, the CAS is really a nice way to orchestrate different kinds of analysis on the, on the same document at different stages of the analysis. So one of the backbone uh, ideas of the CAS is a type system, which is a very, uh, it's a, it's a user-defined uh, representation that's, that's quite expressive and flexible, uh, and, and basically you use it to define the annotations you're going you're gonna, to uh, perform on the document. So, the kinds of types that you would create in a type system are a token, a sentence, part of speech tags. Um, if you were, for example, parsing uh, abstracts from scientific literature, you'd have a set of types corresponding to authors and titles and addresses. Um, each kind of domain or genre is going to have different types that you're going to care about. The CAS also has a very sophisticated indexing uh, uh, schema uh, that allows for API calls like uh, give me a, a book title that would occur before the author annotation that I have. Or in a, a general pattern that you would see is I, I've already run to a tokenizer and sentence detection. I'd like to loop over every sentence and for every sentence loop over every token. Uh, and, then the kinds of, and, then, and then do something on each token. So the kinds of things you might do on a token or, or um, a document uh, is extract features in a machine learning context. So um, a lot of the, the NLP tasks are framed as machine learning tasks. And uh, the CAS basically allows you to write feature extraction libraries that are generic across lots of different type systems so you don't have to re-implement um, the same kind of low-level lexical features that you generally feed into machine learning algorithms. Um, I'll, I'll also just, I don't have any data available at the moment, but um, it's, it's a very efficient, um, high-performance data structure. So as with many frameworks, the price of admission to uh, uh, abstraction paradise, so to speak, is, is configuration hell. Um, and UEMA, UEMA is, is no exception here. 
Uh, if you'd like to um, tag some text, so to speak, uh, with your analysis engine, you just have to do these seven simple, eight, seven simple steps. Uh, wrap your tagger as a UEM analysis engine in, in their API. Write an XML descriptor file. Write a cast consumer. This is an object that takes information out of the cast and writes it out. Write another descriptor file. Write another descriptor file. Write another descriptor file. And then invoke this thing called the collection processing manager uh, with yet another, uh, oh, I guess it's with the previous description, description file, descriptor file. Uh, so uh, to invoke uh, a word used earlier today in a video, uh, if you've done this sort of thing, you feel itchy afterwards. Um, and you, uh, you're not very close to our, our goal here of, of taking an RDD full of strings and just running, tech, you know, analyze this text. So a project that addresses this is called UEMA Fit. It's a subproject of Thin UEMA. If you go to uema.apache.org, uh, there's a there's a um, a link on the left hand side labeled UEMA Fit, and it provides factories for instantiating UEMA components without the descriptor files. It provides injection, which uses Java annotations to remove boilerplate uh, code associated with configuration. The initial use case of this was uh, for unit testing. Uh, because who wants to write descriptor files for unit tests or maintain them, which is, which is worse than writing them. So uh, where we want to get to towards uh, a kind of a simple invocation of UEMA from Spark is to move away from the, the sort of uh, batch pipeline approach. We have a collection reader and, and something on the other end that, that writes out results to encapsulating the whole pipeline into a single method call where you have a string going in and on the other side you have some rich, some rich object that describes the analysis that came out of it. Um, and given, given something like that, you can see pretty simply how we can, how we can do a, a, a flat map on an RDD of strings. So uh, POJO is for plain old Java object. Uh, so uh, basically, we want to shrink wrap the whole thing down into a, a single method call. And th so the technique uh, I've used for that is to have a constructor that creates the analysis engine. This, this method, create analysis engine, uh, could be arbitrarily long and, and contain a number of uh, sub-analysis engines within it. So it would describe an entire pipeline. And then from that analysis engine, you can create uh, one of these CAS objects. So you have to do that at initialization. And then when you call the analyze text method, you pass in a string called my text, you reset the CAS, you set the document text of the CAS, you process your document, and then you extract values from the CAS to, to return to the caller. So uh, there's just kind of one more glitch in this, in this solution, and that is uh, UEMA components are not serializable. Everything in, in Spark needs to be serializable. I haven't tried cryo on this yet. Perhaps that's a, that's a workaround. Uh, but what I've been doing is just simply labeling my member variable that's an analysis engine as transient, and then I implement the read object method and call the initialize method there. That's, that's, that's worked uh, just fine. So uh, in my abstract, I, I promised to provide a complete working example. Um, I've gotten most of the way there, but I, I, it's, it's actually not available yet. I, I will um, post instructions to the Spark users list when that's available. Um, but uh, what I've provided is, or what I've cobbled together so far is really um, an example that shows how to invoke OpenNLP. Uh, it's a little bit of a silly and contrived example because OpenNLP is perfectly fine to call as, as a Java library, uh, but they do provide UEMA wrappers, and so basically I'm providing a, a POJO wrapper around their UEMA wrapper around their, their POJO library. Uh, but it, it, does, it, it is nice to have kind of all the mechanics in one place to demonstrate uh, uh, the API that's required. Uh, and then uh, a simple... Um, example that has the spark of type string that invokes the, the, um, the POJO wrapper. So uh, that's my talk. Yeah, any questions?
Sure. Uh, do you have the, a use case in mind for that? Uh, sorry, the question is, uh, have I looked into breaking up UEMA pipeline for uh, kind of, uh, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, sure, so yeah, so um, one of the kind of simplifying assumptions of what I've done here is that each thread gets the entire UEMA pipeline, and so you're just, you're just running it across I mean, as long as it fits into memory, into each into each node's memory uh, all allocated to it, then it, it, run, it runs really great. Um, you're concerned about uh, a UEMA pipeline that perhaps that takes too much resource to to do it that way. <laughs> sure. Well, so um, UEMA does provide a mechanism to access external resources, which may be too large to give a single instance of that to every thread that's running. Uh, so it would probably make sense to um, configure this in a way where you would have some of those large external resources available per worker that the different threads would, would access. Um, that's kind of built into UEMA, so it shouldn't be too hard to, to make that work across uh, a Spark cluster. Uh, 